Chapter Twelve of The Man Who Was Thursday. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Zachary Brewster Geis, Greenbelt, Maryland, June 2007. The Man Who Was Thursday A Nightmare by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter Twelve the earth in anarchy. Urging the horses to a gallop, without respect to the rather rugged descent of the road, the horsemen soon regained their advantage over the men on the march, and at last the bulk of the first buildings of Lancy cut off the sight of their pursuers. Nevertheless the ride had been a long one, and by the time they reached the real town the west was warming with the color and quality of sunset. The colonel suggested that, before making finally for the police station, they should make the effort, in passing, to attach to themselves one more individual who might be useful. Four out of the five rich men in this town, he said, are common swindlers. I suppose the proportion is pretty equal all over the world. The fifth is a friend of mine, and a very fine fellow, and what is even more important from our point of view, he owns a motor-car. "'I am afraid,' said the professor in his mirthful way, looking back along the white road on which the black crawling patch might appear at any moment, "'I am afraid we have hardly time for afternoon calls.' "'Dr. Renard's house is only three minutes off,' said the colonel. "'Our danger,' said Dr. Bull, "'is not two minutes off.' "'Yes,' said Syme. "'If we ride on fast we must leave them behind, for they are on foot.' "'He has a motor-car,' said the colonel. "'But we may not get it,' said Bull. "'Yes, he is quite on your side. "'But he might be out.' "'Hold your tongue,' said Syme suddenly. "'What is that noise?' For a second they all sat as still as equestrian statues, and for a second, for two or three or four seconds, heaven and earth seemed equally still. Then all their ears, in an agony of attention, heard along the road that indescribable thrill and throb that means only one thing. Horses! The colonel's face had an instantaneous change, as if lightning had struck it, and yet left it scatheless. "'They have done us,' he said, with brief military irony. "'Prepare to receive cavalry!' "'Where can they have got the horses?' asked Syme, as he mechanically urged his steed to a canter. The colonel was silent for a little, then he said in a strained voice, "'I was speaking with strict accuracy when I said that the Soleil d'Or was the only place where one could get horses within twenty miles.' "'No,' said Syme violently. "'I don't believe he'd do it. Not with all that white hair.' "'He may have been first, said the colonel gently. "'They must be at least a hundred strong, for which reason we are all going to see my friend Renard, who has a motor-car.' With those words he swung his horse suddenly round a street corner, and went down the street with such thundering speed that the others, though already well at the gallop, had difficulty in following the flying tail of his horse. Dr. Renard inhabited a high and comfortable house at the top of a steep street, so that when the riders alighted at his door they could once more see the solid green ridge of the hill with the white road across it standing up above all the roofs of the town. They breathed again to see that the road as yet was clear, and they rang the bell. Dr. Renard was a breaming, brown-bearded man, a good example of that silent but very busy professional class which France has preserved even more perfectly than England. When the matter was explained to him he pooh-poohed the panic of the ex-marquis altogether, he said with the solid French scepticism that there was no conceivable probability of a general anarchist rising. Anarchy, he said, shrugging his shoulders. "'It is childishness!' "'Et ça!' cried out the colonel suddenly, pointing over the other's shoulder. "'And that is childishness, isn't it?' They all looked round, and saw a curve of black cavalry come sweeping over the top of the hill with all the energy of Attila. Swiftly as they rode, however, the whole rank still kept well together, and they could see the black visards of the first line as level as the line of uniforms. But although the main black square was the same, though travelling faster, there was now one sensational difference which they could see clearly upon the slope of the hill, as if upon a slanted map. 
The bulk of the riders were in one block, but one rider flew far ahead of the column, and with frantic movements of hand and heel urged his horse faster and faster, so that one might have fancied that he was not the pursuer but the pursued. But even at that great distance they could see something so fanatical, so unquestionable in his figure, that they knew it was the secretary himself. "'I am sorry to cut short a cultured discussion,' said the colonel. "'But can you lend me your motor-car now in two minutes?' "'I have a suspicion that you are all mad,' said Dr. Renard, smiling sociably. "'But God forbid that madness should in any way interrupt friendship. Let us go round to the garage.' Dr. Renard was a mild man, with monstrous wealth. His rooms were like the Musée de Cluny, and he had three motor-cars. These, however, he seemed to use very sparingly, having the simple tastes of the French middle class, and when his impatient friends came to examine them, it took them some time to assure themselves that one of them even could be made to work. This with some difficulty they brought round into the street before the doctor's house. When they came out of the dim garage, they were startled to find that twilight had already fallen with the abruptness of night in the tropics. Either they had been longer in the place than they imagined, or some unusual canopy of cloud had gathered over the town. They looked down the steep streets, and seemed to see a slight mist coming up from the sea. "'It is now or never,' said Dr. Bull. "'I hear horses.' "'No,' corrected the professor. "'A horse.' And as they listened, it was evident that the noise, rapidly coming nearer on the rattling stones, was not the noise of the whole cavalcade, but that of the one horseman who had left it far behind, the insane secretary. Syme's family, like most of those who end in the simple life, had once owned a motor, and he knew all about them. He had leapt at once into the chauffeur's seat, and with flushed face was wrenching and tugging at the disused machinery. He bent his strength upon one handle, and then said quite quietly, "'I am afraid it's no go.' As he spoke, there swept round the corner a man rigid on his rushing horse, with the rush and rigidity of an arrow. He had a smile that thrust out his chin as if it were dislocated. He swept alongside of the stationary car into which his company had crowded, and laid his hand on the front. It was the secretary, and his mouth went quite straight in the solemnity of triumph." Syme was leaning hard upon the steering wheel, and there was no sound but the rumble of the other pursuers riding into the town. Then there came quite suddenly a scream of scraping iron, and the car leapt forward. It plucked the secretary clean out of his saddle, as a knife is whipped out of its sheath, trailed him kicking terribly for twenty yards, and left him flung flat upon the road far in front of his frightened horse. As the car took the corner of the street with a splendid curve, they could just see the other anarchists filling the street and raising their fallen leader. "'I can't understand why it has grown so dark,' said the professor at last in a low voice. "'Going to be a storm, I think,' said Dr. Bull. "'I say, it's a pity we haven't got a light on this car if only to see by.' "'We have,' said the colonel, and from the floor of the car he fished up a heavy, old-fashioned, carved iron lantern with a light inside it. It was obviously an antique and it would seem as if its original use had been in some way semi-religious, for there was a rude moulding of a cross upon one of its sides. "'Where on earth did you get that?' asked the professor. "'I got it where I got the car,' answered the colonel, chuckling, "'from my best friend. While our friend here was fighting with his steering wheel, I ran up the front steps of the house and spoke to Renard, who was standing in his own porch, you will remember. I suppose I said there's no time to get a lamp.' He looked up, blinking amiably at the beautiful arched ceiling of his own front hall. From this was suspended, by chains of exquisite ironwork, this lantern, one of the hundred treasures of his treasure house. By sheer force, he tore the lamp out of his own ceiling, shattering the painted panels and bringing down two blue vases with his violence. Then he handed me the iron lantern, and I put it in the car. Was I not right? when I said that Dr. Renard was worth knowing? "'You were,' said Syme seriously, and hung the heavy lantern over the front. There was a certain allegory of their whole position in the contrast between the modern automobile and its strange ecclesiastical lamp. Hitherto they had passed through the quietest part of the town, meeting at once one or two pedestrians who could give them no hint of the peace or the hostility of the place. Now, however, the windows in the houses began one by one to be lit up, 
giving a greater sense of habitation and humanity. Dr. Bull turned to the new detective who had led their flight, and permitted himself one of his natural and friendly smiles. "'These lights make one feel more cheerful,' Inspector Ratcliffe drew his brows together. "'There is only one set of lights that make me more cheerful,' he said, "'and they are those lights of the police station which I can see beyond the town. Please God we may be there in ten minutes.' Then all Bull's boiling good sense and optimism broke suddenly out of him. "'Oh, this is all raving nonsense!' he cried. "'If you really think that ordinary people in ordinary houses are anarchists, you must be madder than an anarchist yourself. If we turned and fought these fellows, the whole town would fight for us.' "'No,' said the other, with an immovable simplicity. "'The whole town would fight for them. We shall see.' While they were speaking, the professor had leant forward with sudden excitement. "'What is that noise?' he said. "'Oh, the horse is behind us, I suppose,' said the colonel. "'I thought we had got clear of them.' "'The horse is behind us? No,' said the professor. "'It is not horses, and it is not behind us.' Almost as he spoke, across the end of the street before them, two shining and rattling shapes shot past. They were gone almost in a flash, but everyone could see that they were motor-cars, and the professor stood up with a pale face, and swore that they were the other two motor-cars from Dr. Reynal's garage. "'I tell you they were his,' he repeated, with wild eyes, "'and they were full of men in masks.' "'Absurd,' said the colonel angrily. "'Dr. Reynal would never give them his cows.' "'He may have been forced,' said Ratcliffe quietly. "'The whole town is on their side.' "'You still believe that?' asked the colonel incredulously. "'You will all believe it soon,' said the other, with a hopeless calm. There was a puzzled pause for some little time, and then the colonel began again abruptly. "'No, I can't believe it. The thing is nonsense. The plain people of a peaceable French town—' He was cut short by a bang and a blaze of light, which seemed close to his eyes. As the car sped on, it left a floating patch of white smoke behind it, and Syme had heard a shot shriek past his ear. "'My God!' said the colonel. "'Someone has shot at us!' "'It need not interrupt conversation,' said the gloomy Ratcliffe. "'Pray resume your remarks, colonel. You were talking, I think, about the plain people of a peaceable French town.' The staring colonel was long past minding satire. He rolled his eyes all round the street. "'It is extraordinary,' he said. "'Most extraordinary.' "'A fastidious person,' said Syme, might even call it unpleasant. However, I suppose those lights out in the field beyond this street are the gendarmerie. We shall soon get there. No, said Inspector Ratcliffe, we shall never get there. He had been standing up and looking keenly ahead of him. Now he sat down and smoothed his sleek hair with a weary gesture. What do you mean? asked Bull sharply. I mean that we shall never get there, said the pessimist placidly. They have two rows of armed men across the road already. I can see them from here. The town is in arms, as I said it was. I can only wallow in the exquisite comfort of my own exactitude. And Ratcliffe sat down comfortably in the car and lit a cigarette. But the others rose excitedly and stared down the road. Syme had slowed down the car as their plans became doubtful, and he brought it finally to a standstill, just at the corner of a side street that ran down very steeply to the sea. The town was mostly in shadow, but the sun had not sunk. Wherever its level light could break through, it painted everything a burning gold. Up this side street, the last sunset light shone as sharp and narrow as the shaft of artificial light at the theatre. It struck the car of the five friends, and lit it like a burning chariot. But the rest of the street, especially the two ends of it, was in the deepest twilight, and for some seconds they could see nothing. Then Syme, whose eyes were the keenest, broke into a little bitter whistle, and said, it is quite true. There is a crowd or an army or some such thing across the end of that street. Well, if there is, said Bull impatiently, it must be something else, a sham fight or the mayor's birthday or something. I cannot and will not believe that plain jolly people in a place like this walk about with dynamite in their pockets. Get on a bit, Syme, and let us look at them. The car crawled about a hundred yards farther, and then they were all startled by Dr. Bull breaking into a high crow of laughter. "'Why, you silly mugs!' he cried. "'What did I tell you? That crowd's as law-abiding as a cow, and if it weren't, it's on our side.' 
"'How do you know?' asked the professor, staring. "'You blind bat!' cried Bull. "'Don't you see who is leading them?' They peered again, and then the colonel, with a catch in his voice, cried out, "'What? It's Renard!' There was indeed a rank of dim figures running across the road, and they could not be clearly seen. But far enough in front to catch the accident of the evening light was stalking up and down the unmistakable Dr. Renard, in a white hat, stroking his long brown beard, and holding a revolver in his left hand. "'What a fool I've been!' exclaimed the colonel. "'Of course, the dear old boy has turned out to help us.' Dr. Bull was bubbling over with laughter, swinging the sword in his hand as carelessly as a cane. He jumped out of the car and ran across the intervening space, calling out, "'Dr. Renard! Dr. Renard!' An instant after, Syme thought his own eyes had gone mad in his head, for the philanthropic Dr. Renard had deliberately raised his revolver and fired twice at Bull, so that the shots rang down the road. Almost at the same second as the puff of white cloud went up from this atrocious explosion, a long puff of white cloud went up also from the cigarette of the cynical Ratcliffe. Like all the rest, he turned a little pale, but he smiled. Dr. Bull, at whom the bullets had been fired, just missing his scalp, stood quite still in the middle of the road without a sign of fear, and then turned very slowly and crawled back to his car and climbed in with two holes through his hat. "'Well,' said the cigarette smoker slowly, "'what do you think now?' "'I think,' said Dr. Bull with precision, "'that I am lying in bed at number 217 Peabody Buildings, "'and that I shall soon wake up with a jump. "'Or if that's not it, "'I think that I am sitting in a small cushioned cell in Hanwell, "'and that the doctor can't make much of my case. "'But if you want to know what I don't think, I'll tell you. "'I don't think what you think. "'I don't think, and I never shall think, "'that the mass of ordinary men are a pack of dirty modern thinkers.' No, sir, I'm a Democrat, and I still don't believe that Sunday could convert one average navvy or counterjumper. No, I may be mad, but humanity isn't. Syme turned his bright blue eyes on Bull with an earnestness which he did not commonly make clear. You are a very fine fellow, he said. You can believe in sanity which is not merely your sanity, and you're right enough about humanity, about peasants and people like that jolly old innkeeper. But you're not right about Renal. I suspected him from the first. He's rationalistic, and what's worse, he's rich. When duty and religion are really destroyed, it will be by the rich. They are really destroyed now, said the man with the cigarette, and rose with his hands in his pockets. The devils are coming on. The men in the motor car looked anxiously in the direction of his dreamy gaze, and they saw that the whole regiment at the end of the road was advancing upon them, Dr. Renard marching furiously in front, his beard flying in the breeze. The colonel sprang out of the car with an intolerant exclamation. "'Gentlemen,' he cried, "'the thing is incredible. It must be a practical joke. If you knew Renard as I do, it's like calling Queen Victoria a dynamiter. If you had got the man's character into your head—' "'Dr. Bull,' said Syme sardonically, has at least got it into his hat. "'I tell you, it can't be!' cried the colonel, stamping. "'Right now shall explain it. He shall explain it to me!' And he strode forward. "'Don't be in such a hurry,' drawled the smoker. "'He will very soon explain it to all of us.' But the impatient colonel was already out of earshot, advancing towards the advancing enemy. The excited Dr. Renard lifted his pistol again, but perceiving his opponent hesitated and the colonel came face to face with him, with frantic gestures of remonstrance. "'It is no good,' said Syme. "'He will never get anything out of that old heathen. I vote we drive bang through the thick of them, bang as the bullets went through Bull's hat. We may all be killed, but we must kill a tidy number of them.' "'I won't have it,' said Dr. Bull, growing more vulgar in the sincerity of his virtue. "'The poor chaps may be making a mistake. Give the colonel a chance.' "'Shall we go back, then?' asked the professor. "'No,' said Ratcliffe in a cold voice. "'The street behind us is held, too. "'In fact, I seem to see there another friend of yours, Syme.' Syme spun round smartly and stared backwards at the track which they had travelled. He saw an irregular body of horsemen gathering and galloping towards them in the gloom. He saw above the foremost saddle the silver gleam of a sword, and then, as it grew nearer, the silver gleam of an old man's hair. The next moment, with shattering violence, he had swung the motor round and sent it dashing down the steep side street to the sea, like a man that desired only to die. "'What the devil is up?' cried the professor, seizing his arm. 
the morning star has fallen said syme as his own car went down in the darkness like a falling star the others did not understand his words but when they looked back at the street above they saw the hostile cavalry coming round the corner and down the slopes after them and foremost of all rode the good innkeeper flushed with the fiery innocence of the evening light the world is insane said the professor and buried his face in his hands no said dr bull in adamantine humility it is i what are we going to do asked the professor at this moment said syme with a scientific detachment i think we are going to smash into a lamp-post the next instant the automobile had come with a catastrophic jar against an iron object the instant after that four men had crawled out from under a chaos of metal and a tall lean lamp-post that had stood up straight on the edge of the marine parade stood out bent and twisted like the branch of a broken tree well we smashed something said the professor with a faint smile that's some comfort you're becoming an anarchist said syme dusting his clothes with his instinct of daintiness every one is said ratcliffe as they spoke the white-haired horseman and his followers came thundering from above and almost at the same moment a dark string of men ran shouting along the seafront syme snatched a sword and took it in his teeth he stuck two others under his armpits took a fourth in his left hand and the lantern in his right and leapt off the high parade on to the beach below the others leapt after him with a common acceptance of such decisive action leaving the debris and the gathering mob above them we have one more chance said syme taking the steel out of his mouth whatever all this pandemonium means i suppose the police station will help us we can't get there for they hold the way but there's a pier or breakwater runs out into the sea just here which we could defend longer than anything else like horatius and his bridge we must defend it till the gendarmerie turn out keep after me they followed him as he went crunching down the beach and in a second or two their boots broke not on the sea gravel but on broad flat stones they marched down a long low jetty running out in one arm into the dim boiling sea and when they came to the end of it they felt that they had come to the end of their story they turned and faced the town that town was transfigured with uproar all along the high parade from which they had just ascended was a dark and roaring stream of humanity with tossing arms and fiery faces groping and glaring towards them the long dark line was dotted with torches and lanterns but even where no flame lit up a furious face they could see in the farthest figure in the most shadowy gesture an organized hate it was clear that they were the accursed of all men and they knew not why two or three men looking little and black like monkeys leapt over the edge as they had done and dropped onto the beach these came ploughing down the deep sand shouting horribly and strove to wade into the sea at random the example was followed and the whole black mass of men began to run and drip over the edge like black treacle foremost among the men on the beach syme saw the peasant who had driven their cart he splashed into the surf on a huge cart horse and shook his axe at them the peasant cried syme they have not risen since the middle ages even if the police do come now said the professor mournfully they can do nothing with this mob nonsense said bull desperately there must be some people left in the town who are human no said the hopeless inspector the human being will soon be extinct we are the last of mankind it may be said the professor absently then he added in his dreamy voice what is all that at the end of the dunkade no public flame no private dares to shine nor human light is left nor glimpse divine lo thy dread empire chaos is restored light dies before thine uncreating word thy hand great anach lets the curtain fall and universal darkness buries all stop cried bull suddenly the gendarmes are out the low lights of the police station were indeed blotted and broken with hurrying figures and they heard through the darkness the clash and jingle of a disciplined cavalry they are charging the mob cried bull in ecstasy or alarm no said syme they are formed along the parade they have unslung their carbines cried bull dancing with excitement yes said ratcliffe and they are going to fire on us as he spoke there came a long crackle of musketry and bullets seemed to hop like hailstones on the stones in front of them the gendarmes have joined them cried the professor and struck his forehead i am in the padded cell said bull solidly 
There was a long silence, and then Ratcliffe said, looking out over the swollen sea, all a sort of grey-purple, "'What does it matter, who is mad or who is sane? We shall all be dead soon.' Syme turned to him and said, "'You are quite hopeless, then?' Mr. Ratcliffe kept a stony silence, then at last he said quietly, "'No. Oddly enough, I am not quite hopeless. There is one insane little hope that I cannot get out of my mind. The power of this whole planet is against us, yet I cannot help wondering whether this one silly little hope is hopeless yet.' "'In what or whom is your hope?' asked Syme with curiosity. "'In a man I never saw,' said the other, looking at the leaden sea. "'I know what you mean,' said Syme in a low voice. "'The man in the dark room. But Sunday must have killed him by now.' "'Perhaps,' said the other steadily. "'But if so, he was the only man whom Sunday found it hard to kill.' "'I heard what you said,' said the professor, with his back turned. "'I also am holding hard on to the thing I never saw.' All of a sudden Syme, who was standing as if blind with introspective thought, swung round and cried out like a man waking from sleep. "'Where is the Colonel? I thought he was with us.' "'The Colonel! Yes!' cried Bull. "'Where on earth is the Colonel?' "'He went to speak to Renard,' said the Professor. "'We cannot leave him among all those beasts,' cried Syme. "'Let us die like gentlemen if—' "'Do not pity the Colonel,' said Ratcliffe, with a pale sneer. "'He is extremely comfortable. He is—' "'No, no, no!' cried Syme in a kind of frenzy. "'Not the Colonel, too! I will never believe it!' "'Will you believe your eyes?' asked the other, and pointed to the beach. Many of the pursuers had waded into the water, shaking their fists, but the sea was rough, and they could not reach the pier. Two or three figures, however, stood on the beginning of the stone footway, and seemed to be cautiously advancing down it. The glare of a chance lantern lit up the faces of the two foremost— one face wore a black half-mask, and under it the mouth was twisting about in such a madness of nerves that the black tuft of beard wriggled round and round like a restless living thing. The other was the red face and white moustache of Colonel Ducroix. They were in earnest consultation. "'Yes, he is gone, too,' said the professor, and sat down on a stone. "'Everything's gone. I'm gone. I can't trust my own bodily machinery. I feel as if my own hand might fly up and strike me.' "'When my hand flies up,' said Syme, "'it will strike somebody else.' And he strode along the pier towards the colonel, the sword in one hand and the lantern in the other. As if to destroy the last hope or doubt, the colonel, who saw him coming, pointed his revolver at him and fired. The shot missed Syme, but struck his sword, breaking it short at the hilt. Syme rushed on and swung the iron lantern above his head. "'Judas before Herod!' he said, and struck the colonel down upon the stones. Then he turned to the secretary, whose frightful mouth was almost foaming now, and held the lamp high with so rigid and arresting a gesture that the man was, as it were, frozen for a moment, and forced to hear. "'Do you see this lantern?' cried Syme in a terrible voice. "'Do you see the cross carved on it, and the flame inside? You did not make it. You did not light it. Better men than you, men who could believe and obey, twisted the entrails of iron, and preserved the legend of fire.' There is not a street you walk on, there is not a thread you wear, that was not made as this lantern was, by denying your philosophy of dirt and rats. You can make nothing, you can only destroy. You will destroy mankind, you will destroy the world, let that suffice you. Yet this one old Christian lantern you shall not destroy. It shall go where your empire of apes will never have the wit to find it. He struck the secretary once with the lantern, so that he staggered and then whirling it twice round his head, sent it flying far out into sea, where it flared like a roaring rocket, and fell. "'Swords!' shouted Syme, turning his flaming face to the three behind him. "'Let us charge these dogs, for our time has come to die!' His three companions came after him, sword in hand. Syme's sword was broken, but he rent a bludgeon from the fist of a fisherman, flinging him down. In a moment they would have flung themselves upon the face of the mob and perished, when an interruption came. The secretary— ever since Syme's speech, had stood with his hand to his stricken head as if dazed. Now he suddenly pulled off his black mask. The pale face thus peeled in the lamplight revealed not so much rage as astonishment. He put up his hand with an anxious authority. "'There is some mistake,' he said. "'Mr. Syme, I hardly think you understand your position. I arrest you in the name of the law.' 
"'Of the law?' said Syme, and dropped his stick. "'Certainly,' said the secretary. "'I am a detective from Scotland Yard.' And he took a small blue card from his pocket. "'And what do you suppose we are?' asked the professor, and threw up his arms. "'You,' said the secretary stiffly, "'are, as I know for a fact, members of the Supreme Anarchist Council. Disguised as one of you, I—' Dr. Bull tossed his sword into the sea. "'There never was any Supreme Anarchist Council,' he said. "'We were all a lot of silly policemen looking at each other, and all these nice people who have been peppering us with shot thought we were the dynamiters.' I knew I couldn't be wrong about the mob, he said, beaming over the enormous multitude, which stretched away to the distance on both sides. Vulgar people are never mad. I'm vulgar myself, and I know. I am now going on shore to stand a drink to everybody here. End of chapter 12